uh, book of Jude was written by the youngest brother of Jesus. Now, the name Jude uh, comes from the Hebrew uh, name Judah, like one different, different Jude than that. Um, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, also one of the 12 tribes of Israel, if you remember that. Uh, the book Jude is written between 58 and, and 60 AD, making it actually one of the earliest New Testament books that was completed, at least chronologically. It was written primarily to a Jewish uh, audience, a Jewish believer audience, and it's evident by some of the references that Jude makes throughout the course of this very, very short book, being only 25 verses long, the whole book. So we're going to walk through this book together, reading the bulk of it like we have not done thus far in one story, because usually I'll just summarize the book and then it pick one poignant spot to drill down deep on, uh, but this book is so short, I thought we'd just kind of go through pretty much the whole thing. So Judah, uh, Jude writes here now to a first century group of primarily Jewish believers, but it really does carry important messages for every believer in every context on earth. Here are the main themes from the book of Jude. First, contend for the faith, he says. In other words, there is a truth that's worth fighting for. God's truth matters. The second thing is that he's telling us deception abounds in this world. In other words, there are those who are trying actively to manipulate religion, a religion for their own personal gain. It happens all over the place. Third thing is, it matters. He tells us it matters how we live our lives. It's not no big deal, it does matter. In other words, God's grace is meant to free us, not give us some license for sin and deeper bondage. He wants to free us by his grace. Now, one thing that we discover as we read through the book of Jude is that Jude actually refers to two extra biblical books. He refers to the te- a book called the Testament of Moses in verse 9, and also the, a, a book called the Book of Enoch in, in uh, verse 14. Uh, Now, that is no reason at all to discount what Jude writes, because the Bible has other places in which it refers to non-biblical books. Uh, We looked closely at one of those examples just a few weeks ago when we were studying the book of Titus, if you remember that. If you were here, we remember that Titus quoted a Cretan philosopher uh, of that day, um, and it was, his name was Epimenides, if you were here. It was a pretty powerful episode that links to Holy Scripture in a really miraculous way. It's pretty cool. If you were not here for that week, you, uh, try to tune in on our YouTube channel and see if you can uh, check out that message because it was kind of pivotal. Now, by the second half of the first century, there were already a lot of false teachers that had kind of infiltrated the ranks of the believers. And Jude writes to identify those as the people who cause divisions and distort the truth of God. It's a warning. He's giving a warning. He's giving a very good warning because it still happens today and it happens all over the place. Uh, So we're going to start right off in Jude, uh, starting in verse number one. Here's what he writes. This letter is from Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Now, James was the leader of the New Testament church in Jerusalem. He says, I'm writing to all who have been called by God the Father, who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write you about the salvation we all share, but now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So Jude's reason for writing this letter is pretty clear. Intruders had sown seeds of false teaching amongst the believers that was creating chaos and confusion amongst them. So Jude urges them here. He says, preserve and contend for and defend the body of truth that we have received from the inspired Word of God from the teaching ministry of the apostles themselves. He's saying, make sure that the good news of Jesus remains a pure message, not diluted and not confused by adding all kinds of nonsense to it, which is what people were doing. Yeah, you got to believe in Jesus, but you also got to do this, this, and this. It's clear uh, that he is not speaking, Jude is not speaking of faith 
meaning just believing in God. He's talking about the Christian faith and the whole of it. And the, it kind of en- encompasses the body of truth that we receive from the word of God that was delivered by the apostles, what we look at as the gospel in the New Testament writings. Jude uses an athletic metaphor here uh, to kind of drive home the point that we need to, to struggle, to wrestle as in a great contest, like in a race, uh, exerting whatever effort is necessary to advance the gospel while at the same time defending these core beliefs from the threat of false teachers, okay? Now let's pick up uh, where we left off. Verse five, Jude says, so I wanna remind you, though you already know these things, that the Lord first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. Okay, here's where he starts kind of pulling up Jewish history, uh, showing them that his, uh, us, that his audience is at least mostly Jewish believers. He reminds them of how God rescued their ancestors from their slavery in Egypt for 400 years and how God led them all through the desert. And that he reminds them that some of those, the the wanderers, they remained faithless in spite of seeing all of these incredible miracles. Then he refers to the fallen angels, which is written about in Genesis chapter six. When some of them, it says, they left heaven and came to earth, preying upon the women of that day. And as a result, he says that God has them in chains waiting for judgment. It's a weird episode. I know it's never totally explained in scripture. It's just, okay, there it is. Then then Jude refers to the, the judgment that came upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which he says has fully given themselves, they fully gave themselves over to unapologetic sexual sin. He actually says the phrase, every kind of sexual perversion. And those cities were destroyed by fire. So it's a good thing there's no unapologetic sexual sin in our day, huh? Insert eye roll here. (laughs) That kind of stuff matters, friends. It matters. God does not wink at perversion that hurts people. People that he dearly loves and sent Jesus to die for people that he wants to be free and hurts them. So what are we to expect with that knowledge in mind? That certainly as a nation, we have strayed far from God's plan for us. And there are plenty of people all over the world, plenty of people in the United States that say, God is going to smite America. And the the common phrase is, God either has to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah or smite America or any nation that defies him the way that we have. It happened in the Old Testament, they say, and absolutely, yes, it did. Here's a few questions about that. Certainly, it's not everyone in America that's bound in sexual sin and defying God. Lots of people love God and follow him with all of their hearts. Should God smite America? Also, in what nation is there no sexual sin and no defying of God, even in thought? Because Jesus made it clear that the sin in your mind is just like sinning with your actions. So which nation is it that stands in mighty perfection before a holy God? None. None. Yes, God is perfectly just. Perfectly just. And certainly humanity is deserving of some kind of punishment. Here is where the good news comes in. Here's where the good news comes in. Romans 3.25, look at this verse. For God sent Christ Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to end all of God's anger against us. He used Christ's blood and our faith as the means of saving us from his wrath. Good news, right? Now, God also says in the book of Romans, he also makes it clear that he says, those who reject God, says they receive in themselves the penalty for their sin. Because when we are rejectors of God as individuals, as people, 
When we reject God, we are living a life void of God, and we get the misery that comes along with that because life without God is really no life at all. It's empty. It's void. It's purposeless. It's hopeless. And the Bible tells us, Jesus took the punishment upon himself that every person deserved, and he paid it for all of us. That's the good news. Okay, now are you ready for what might be the weirdest verses in the whole Bible? <laughs> in verse 8, here's, where it's, here's what it says. In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives, defy authority, and scoff at supernatural beings. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Micah was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. Huh, that's not weird at all. <laughs> this is not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture, the whole Bible. It says at some point, Michael the archangel, of which there is only one really specifically proclaimed in Scripture, two others by extrapolation could be the angel Gabriel and then at another point, it, yeah, Lucifer, uh, who is referred to as Satan after the fall, could be seen as archangels. But Michael is arguing about the body of Moses. What is that all about? Here's what we do know. Here's what we do know. God himself buried the body of Moses. The Bible tells us that. In Deuteronomy 34, it says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. The Lord buried him in a valley near Beth Peor in Moab, but to this day nobody knows the exact place. Okay, so God buried him. That's in Scripture. But angels arguing about the body of Moses? This is the reference to the non-biblical writing known as the Testament of Moses. That book cannot be found today. It's lost. Uh, but it wasn't a canonized text anyway. It didn't belong in the Bible. Um, the church father from the second century by the name of Origen, who's a very respected church father, he refers to this in one of his writings as a historical Jewish writing of the day. So that's where that reference comes from. But it begs the question, I know, why is Michael arguing with Satan about the body of Moses? Now, many scholars believe that this is due to the ancient Jewish tendency to worship the wrong stuff. And so, of, of which there are many examples, just a couple, like the golden calf that uh, they worshiped in the Exodus, and also the bronze serpent that they ended up worshiping in the book of Numbers. So due to that tendency, the bones of Moses were hidden by God himself. Otherwise, because Moses was held in such high esteem by the people, the people might just end up worshiping at the grave of Moses. Wouldn't be unthinkable, and certainly that seems like something that Satan would have wanted. Anything that confuses people gets them off track. So Michael is resisting and not letting the whereabouts become revealed. God wanted the location to be hidden, and Michael's going to make sure that it stays that way. Weird story, but there it is, <laughs> right there. All right, now let's look at the last section of uh, uh, the next section we're going to read, starting in verse 10. It says, These people scoff at things they do not understand. Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them, and so they bring about their own destruction. What sorrow awaits them? For they follow in the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brother. He's referring to Cain and Abel were the sons of Adam who lived after Adam and Eve had been expelled from the Garden of Eden. Cain... The first human born also became the first murderer. Not a great sign for the future of humanity. Now, verse 11 says, Like Balaam, they deceive people for money. Balaam was a prophet who took a bribe from people in order to prophesy against the people of God. And he's the one that God stopped in what he was doing by speaking to him in a very, very unusual way. Some of you know that story. It's too long to go into. So I'm going to move on to verse 12. It says, like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. Korah led a rebellion against Moses in the desert during the Exodus. All the rebels ended up dying when the ground opened up and swallowed them. 
Rebellion, never a good thing with God. Never ends well. All right, now down to verse 20. But you, Jude writes, but you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. In this way, he says, you keep yourselves safe in God's love. We live a life that's filled with choices and our choices matter. Uh, here, Jude is encouraging us to do some very, very certain things. Build up our faith, pray in the Holy Spirit, and await the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in so doing, he says, we keep ourselves safe in God's love. Now, here's, I guess I'll say it this way. There's a certain sort of partnership uh, with us and God when it comes to this safe in God's love sort of premise. God holds us securely in his hands, he does. We don't make mistakes and fall out of his care. We don't even sin our way out of his kingdom. But choosing a life of sin in this world will certainly change your experience of being a Christian. Absolutely, how? Well, some of the most miserable people I have ever met are Christians who won't trust God enough to leave their old life behind. They're kind of caught between the two worlds, caught between two lives. There are things they just don't want to let go of and they're unwilling to let go of. Like we talked about last week, where those who are drowning but won't let go of the rock that they're holding. They think they need it. It's killing them. It's killing them. Now verse 22 says, Show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. These are those, those are three references all to reaching out to others that are in differing types of circumstances. First, he says to believers whose faith is wavering. I mean, maybe they have hit some rough patches in life and it's shaken them, it's shaken their faith. Well, don't, don't judge them for faltering. You don't know what they have been through. So help them, show mercy to them, he's saying. See what you can do to be an assistance to them. You know, it is, it's really easy to point at sin and wrongdoing. That's one of the easiest things on earth to do. Takes no skill, takes no talent, takes no love, takes no compassion. Ah, you're doing something wrong. Pretty effortless. But there is a, a different sort of approach that God wants us to take. I mean, if someone is around you and they are struggling, then let us be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem. Condemning someone never helps. He also uh, says this interesting phrase, rescue others by snatching them from the fire or from the flames of judgment. Maybe you see somebody that's in real, real danger. And if they continue on this track of the way that they're living, bad things are going to happen. And maybe it's something that you yourself have some experience in and you know what's at stake. So without judging, speak to them, offer hope and offer practical help. But be humble in your approach to them. Be humble in your speaking to them. You know, I, I don't know exactly what it is that you're going through, but I have found that when I go through, when I'm facing something really tough, something really difficult, Jesus has meant the world to me. I find my peace, my hope in him. I find my strength in him. He has never, ever failed me. In that way, you can give someone hope and help. Jude goes on here. He goes, show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, he says, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Here's what I believe Jude is speaking to us here. Um, he's talking about the well-intentioned efforts of a believer to reach out to a friend by accompanying, accompanying them into the environment in which they are trapped. But not everyone is equipped to do that. Some are. I mean, a, a former alcoholic probably shouldn't choose a bar as their place of ministry. Uh, others can, and they do, and that's great. But for someone who has struggled with that type of temptation, just be aware that the enemy would love to take you down. Jude is saying here, yes, show mercy, do what you can, but do so with great caution. 
Use Holy Spirit discernment as to how, when, and where you're going to reach out to others. All right, last verse we'll look at today. This is Jude's great benediction here, starting in verse 24. He writes, Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. I love that. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time, in the present, and beyond all time. Amen. And he wraps it up. He's saying from eternity past to this day to eternity future, all glory to him alone. He can keep us from falling, thank God, and present us on that day without a single fault. Why? Because I lived a perfect life? Nope. Not at all. Because our Savior Jesus Christ, our Lord, did that for me. And although I have more faults than most, that is not how God sees me. He sees me. He sees you spotless, blameless, perfect, and without fault, and ready to join him in his everlasting kingdom of joy. That's really good news. <laughs> That's really good news. And Jude writes to remind us of that. I want you to bow your heads and we'll pray. Lord, we thank you for this short but powerful letter uh, written by Jude. Lord, we thank you for these words which both lift our soul, Lord, and remind us of the good news and also sober us because it matters how we live. So, Lord, I pray that it would increase our dependence upon you, increase our quickness to come to you and say, Lord, I need help. Uh, Lord, I, I want to... I want to do what you want me to do in this situation. Would you speak to me? Would you lead me? Lord, bring us to the place where we, we just cling to you as a way of life. Because from you, Lord, comes our strength, our joy, our peace, our love, our inspiration for life. So God, help us to cling to you more deeply than ever. We believe you for this, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.